Here we are. And and then we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you. That, well, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to Horasis USA. This panel is on infrastructure investment and the lacklusterness thereof. Um, uh, Mahana Shapakar, our, our our planned moderator, uh, unfortunately is not able to join us today. So you're stuck with just Jonathan and myself. Uh, I'm going to give a, a quick introduction background, and then I'm going to hand it to Jonathan. Jonathan will give you 30 seconds on his background just to set the table, and then we are going to have a, uh, a little chat about infrastructure investment and the supply chain and all the issues happening today. And uh, I think uh, this is a very interesting topic that I'm excited to discuss with you all. Um, I have been in the policy space uh, in the Washington, D.C. area uh, for about 20 years. I worked on Capitol Hill. I worked at the uh, U.S. Department of Labor in, uh, for eight years as a research analyst for Capital Alpha Partners, an investor advisor research firm. Um, you know, working on transportation policy as well as labor, immigration, and industrial issues generally, as well as some macro coverage. Uh, then I spent four years helping run the policy office at the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Policy for uh, for the department. Uh, so a lot of it, very interesting issues, of course, have come across transportation in recent years, infrastructure, technology, supply chain, lots of interesting things. Uh, but Jonathan, um, you know, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll we'll jump into the topic. Great. Thanks so much, Lauren. Great, great to be here with you today. And uh, again, for those of you who just joined, uh, our moderator is unfortunately down with COVID, and uh, we are self-moderating this today. So it'll be very conversational, and would love to include you in the the discussion here as well as much as possible. Uh, by way of background, uh, my name is Jonathan Tower. I'm a co-founder of an ESG and social impact investment firm based in Boston called Arcteris Impact Investors. And for 13 years, we've been focused exclusively on investment in private equity and infrastructure projects located in low-income communities. We've partnered with uh, U.S. Treasury Department on uh, funds, as well as uh, cities, counties, and states throughout the United States. And uh, really what we're aiming to do here is help communities become their future goals. We want them to achieve what they want to become over the long term. And uh, we work with communities to lay out their plans. Thematically, these usually include racial, e racial equity, narrowing the racial e wealth equity gap, creating quality living wage jobs, uh, affordable housing, uh, access to broadband, access to quality health care, and uh, other social determinants of health. So. Um, we have been, as I mentioned, doing this for 13 years now, started at the bottom of the great financial crisis in 2009, and we've uh, adapted from time to time as federal programs have changed. What originally came out of the 2010 Jobs Act uh, really shifted more towards uh, philanthropically or organized uh, partnerships in 2017. And uh, then at the end of 2017, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which created Opportunity Zones, suddenly we realized that, hey, this Opportunity Zone tool is better than all the tools we have in the shed combined for addressing funding gaps for community infrastructure projects. So we've been uh, building funds on this. Again, we're on Fund 7 now and uh, continue to uh, do work to help communities build the infrastructure that they need in order to be able to create pathways to prosperity for their residents. So with that, I'll happily turn it back to Lauren. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, those are very hot and very important topics. I guess, uh, you know, first, you know, when we're thinking about infrastructure, you know, uh, a big part of my work has been thinking about how the supply chain has been interacted, uh, it's it being interacted with on the infrastructure side and, uh, you know, our need for infrastructure. And um, I, I, I'm going to ask you, uh, in a moment about you know how we think about different communities specifically um, being looped in on infrastructure projects. I think you know of course the uh, big topic in the U.S. here is the large infrastructure bill that was signed into law by President Biden back in November, a 1.9 trillion dollar uh, infrastructure investment and jobs act, the, the official title of the bill, uh, and the Biden administration right now is working on implementing that. And um, you know one of my big themes for the supply change, the, the supply chain challenge overall um, 
is uh, I have a couple of different themes that I sort of divided into to sort of explain to folks what's happening with the supply chain, both geopolitics, companies realigning their, their international supply chains or global supply chains, um, the regulatory framework, you know, what are the regulations that policymakers are putting in place that will either help or, you know, slow down, you know, slow down, you know, improving the supply chain challenges. So that's an important uh, policy issue to be aware of. And then also the labor shortage. Uh, you know, I, I think in a lot of a lot of developed countries, uh, but particularly in the U.S., the workforce shortage has been a big challenge for the supply chain. But um, uh, to turn specifically to the uh, infrastructure challenges, um, there are a lot of ways in which improving infrastructure can improve uh, the economy, freight flows, uh, addressing the supply chain crunch. And I think particularly we, we think about ports, the, um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the ocean shipping that's coming in, the backups that the U.S. has experienced over the last couple of years, partly because there's things like not enough places to put the empty containers. Um, that's been a big part of it, uh, upping our, uh, the, the, the freight network uh, around the, the country uh, and globally, um, you, you need to increase the amount of infrastructure that is dedicated to efficient movement of freight. Uh, uh, for the past 10 or 15 years, there has been this um, you know, projection that over the next 15 years or by, you know, by 2030, by 2035, there's going to be a massive increase in the amount of freight that's moving in terms of values and volumes. Um, and um, COVID has been an accelerant on that. Even more and more people are able to stay home and just sort of order what they want to be brought directly to them. And so that makes that makes the the um, not only um, uh, does that increase the actual flows of freight, but it also increases the visibility of freight to people who may not have given it much thought before. So that makes that a very significant priority and an area that um, that uh, we'll need to see a lot more infrastructure investment into. Uh, and the Biden administration has been uh, making that a big focus, announcing half a billion dollars for new port infrastructure development grants, focusing on uh, different uh, different uh, infrastructure avenues, different connecting points in the freight network. Um, but um, uh, Jonathan, I want to tie it back to the ESG issues. How do you see uh, you know infrastructure being focused on areas, especially traditionally underserved areas, low income minority communities? What's the, you know, how should we be thinking about that from an investor standpoint and just from a practical standpoint? If you look at uh, U.S. communities over the history of our country uh, being uh, located proximate to a uh, transportation hub is, is usually a, a key determinant of success. Uh, you're along a, a river, a seaway, um, you have a uh, railroad coming through town, or you, you happen to be lucky, you're in a town that railroad suddenly announces it's going through, that those kinds of things uh, up, uh, up pretty significantly. Um, it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, I generally uh, would 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 say, hey, let's let's let free markets capitalism solve these kinds of problems. But when you think of the uh, the uh, national highway system or rail systems or things like that. Um, this, this is not typically something where you have competition between freeway A and freeway B. It's really freeway versus rail versus uh, other you know, air freight or different, different kinds of solutions. Um, all of these transportation issues are incredibly large, but there's nothing as large today that will determine failure versus success of communities as access to the information highway. And that's one that we're really focused on right now. Um, take Brockton, Massachusetts, uh, low income census tract south of Boston. Uh, they had a golden age right after the Civil War and the economy has been declining ever since. Um, it is going through a population explosion right now because of transit oriented development. And as a matter of fact, the primary fiber link that connects Boston and New York goes right beneath its streets. The problem is that that information highway has no solving, solving their broadband issue. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how do you solve this? Well, I mean, uh, you know, one thing that we're working on in Brockton right now is, is literally to tear up their streets, uh, do some deferred maintenance on the streets, on the conduits, on the sewerage, and uh, run the broadband fibers through the uh, below ground conduits with on ramps and off ramps so that they can serve the communities of low income individuals and businesses along those areas. It's kind of like rural, infra uh, rural electrification infrastructure back in the 1920s. 
even if the people don't make enough money to pay market rate for those broadband fiber connections, you've still kind of got to do it. Because if you don't do it now, those communities will be left behind in the dust for the next 20 years. If you do do it, it will accelerate their economic recovery post COVID. So um, these are great roles for government and private enterprise to collaborate. Uh, fortunately, we have opportunity zones, fortunately with Infrastructure Act, States like Maine, where we're doing a ton of broadband fiber infrastructure, just received $350 million. I mean, that, that's enough to solve the broadband fiber problem in a state like Maine, which has topography that is challenging. You've got people that live five miles apart from one another. You've got rolling hills. You've got snow. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not an easy one to solve. But in, in Maine, we're doing uh, five low-income communities, uh, full towns right now at this point where uh, we're laying the fiber, we're either renting it to an ISP or to the government. We've partnered with the government to, to get risk mitigation. Um, but those, those kinds of projects, um, you know, they don't make a ton of money, but you want downside protection because, because they're not, you know, th these aren't your typical private equity investments that make you home run returns because they have modest returns. You also want to mitigate the risk. Um, the most important thing I think I can say, uh, leave you with here today, when you're thinking about public policy decisions or just business ventures in general, is um, de-risking the front end cost of these types of projects. Uh, whether it's um, an annex to a hospital, whether it's uh, broadband fiber, these large scale infrastructure projects, the riskiest slice of capital is the one that goes in for soft cost and development, the one that goes in for permitting and site selection and paying architects. Because if that project fails to proceed, you have a hundred percent loss of your capital. And there's there's time delay, there's cost delay, there's the you know, go no go on the project. We partnered with the Colorado Health Foundation to bring broadband fiber to eight different communities. Um, initially, this project started pre-COVID. We were focused on medical deserts, places that were more than an hour away from the nearest hospital. And we said, okay, telehealth, Native American tribal lands, rural communities, they need better connectivity. It ties right into social determinants of health. Um, how do we solve that? Well, it's a huge financial risk to spend half a million or a million dollars getting permits or doing demographic analysis because even if the project approves, it's probably not profitable enough to uh, to pay you back for that initial investment. It, it, definitely not on a risk adjusted basis, but we were able to solve that with an upfront cash grant from the Colorado Health Foundation that paid for the soft costs. It paid for that risky a slice so that once we got the approval to proceed, we could use our opportunity zone capital and a 20% downside guarantee protection um, agreement with the foundation to do about $50 million of equity investment to do that broadband fiber. We're doing the same thing with a Colorado hospital right now. It's a Medicaid hospital. No, no investor in a Medicaid hospital makes a lot of money off of investing in Medicaid hospitals. These are not meant to be like, oh, suddenly I'm going to go public and make a ton of money off of a Medicaid hospital. These are meant to be necessary critical infrastructure projects that help low income individuals. But again, the risky part of it is the permitting, the design. Are we actually going to get the approval to proceed? So uh, in a situation like that, again, we're, we're looking to government and philanthropy to solve that risky part, which might be 2% of the project, but it's the one that investors don't want to touch. That 2% unlocks the other 98% to enable project financing for the community. That's outstanding. Um, and just to, you know, the... <laughs> Uh, offer a, an angle on that uh, from my own my own transportation background. Um, that's just uh, incredibly important. Uh, some of the numbers that we looked at at, at DOT in a rural area, uh, you're basically twice as likely to die uh, if you're in a car accident, uh, twice as likely to be uh, to, to uh, be involved in a fatality. Um, and a lot of it is that what they call the golden hour, uh, getting to a hospital. So when you talk about uh, medical deserts. Uh, that's that's incredibly important, and it's and it's very timely. I think just just this week, um, the, um, the 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 federal agency uh, NHTSA uh, within DOT that tracks uh, roadway fatalities in the U.S. came out with the 2020 numbers, and they're uh, you know it based uh, 39,000 uh, lives lost uh, on U.S. roadways, and um, which is which is basically unchanged. It's funny that you know COVID has you know altered many things, 
uh, but the raw number of people that die every year uh, in accidents on the roadways has basically not changed. Um, I mean, it's, you know, picks up a little bit, picks up, picks down a little bit, uh, but basically you haven't seen any significant, uh, you know, change more than, you know, 1%, basically. Um, and so, um, you know, we think about those bigger factors, uh, certainly, you know, being able to get to care in a, in a, in a timely and proximate way is, is very, very helpful. So, you know, from, from that side, you know, uh, great work. Thank you. Keep it up. <laughs> but uh, but that's, that, that really is very interesting when you think about ways you can unlock capital and just, you know, take advantage of, uh, take advantage of the playing field, to try to get more money into investments that, that are badly needed. And I think with infrastructure, you know, we think about um, the ability to, to get investments in there and get, get infrastructure that can be offered as an investment tool. Um, is really important because it's nice, it's long term, it's you know secure. You know the um, uh, you know, big, the biggest challenge we have is that the, the U.S. is uh, and this is true of all a lot of developed countries, but the U.S. is the is the toughest country in the world to build new infrastructure in uh, for various reasons. And so you know when you're looking for investment opportunities, you know it's, it's hard if there aren't enough projects to actually look at seriously. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's so, it's so true. Uh, but, uh, Lauren, I mean, I, on the, the transportation side, um, how, how much, how much of that world has changed or is changing because of the consolidation of say Amazon and Walmart, suddenly you've got, uh, you, you, you've got large companies that can command you the post office for, for certain, uh, for certain products. Is is there is there any sense that some of these companies can carry a greater share of the overall infrastructure um, investment costs going forward? I, I'm not I'm not necessarily advocating that you know Amazon pays more to the post office for delivering packages, but but I am thinking if uh, if they are overburdening certain post offices or if if uh, if, if uh, you know new roads are being built out to Amazon development centers. Um, is is there some sense that uh, corporate America can can share in that expense if they're if they are the primary uh, beneficiaries? Oh, that, that's that's a great question. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, before I answer, I'm going to say I see a couple folks uh, that are in the audience that have hands up, and 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 I see you, and I'm not going to mm-hmm. forget about you. Um, if you want to if you want to type comments in the uh, comment box, uh, that's great too. We, we will we will answer all questions. Um, but uh, I, I, just, I just want you to know that, uh, that I, I, I do see the hands raised um, on the, um, uh, you know, it, uh, Jonathan, I think the way that we think about, um, I, I think about the infrastructure investment is um, it's, it, I, I think it's going to take time. I think we're going to see over the next you know, year or two, um, you know, how we, how we think about uh you know how we think about get, getting those, uh, getting um, Amazon more integrated into package delivery. I think we're we we we're we're sort of still seeing the growth the growth phase of what it means to have Amazon doing so much package delivery. I think typically there's been a little bit of a um, uh, little bit of a symbiotic relationship between the post office over the last you know twenty plus years um, and and Amazon is sort of a, a sort of a middle mile. Um, you know, it was last mile and then it was more middle mile as Amazon has now launched its own, you know, delivery be- fleet of delivery vehicles. And I think we don't quite yet know, you know how that how that's going to fit because it's still it's still evolving. Um, Congress right now in Washington is um, in the process of, of um, uh, making a few reforms to the Postal Service that are mainly going to involve um, more, you know, try, more money to try to shore up. Uh, postal service operations, so they're not, so they're not hemorrhaging mm-hmm. um, cash, and I think that I think that how that proceeds, you know, may tell us a little bit about what the future structure is going to be. Is it going to continue to be a symbiotic relationship, or you know, is it, you 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 raise the issue of you know the, the rates that Amazon pays for postal movement, and are they are they sort of you know using more than their fair share of the service? And I think I think that's a little bit of an open question. Um, I mean, what what is fair is sort of like it depends on what what the postal service um, uh, chooses to charge and, and whether or not the economics uh, bear it out. Um, but I think I think it, you know it, it's a, it's a tricky topic because everyone's like, well, I don't know, Amazon maybe <laughs> how, how how is this going to um, how are we uh, you know is 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 the system going to continue to work for everybody? Uh, yeah. And again, the postal service is is 
is not, you know, it is not on its last legs. I mean, certainly if, um, if what Congress is doing pushes it through, um, I think we're going to see that, that the, the, that, that the postal service has the backing of the, of the federal government. And so, um, is, is Amazon, you know, somehow bankrupting the postal service or, you know, hollowing it out. Um, I, I think probably, you know, what we may need another year or two to see how that evolves. And certainly Walmart, you know, it's a similar, it's a similar question in terms of the, the, the logistics usage, uh, and the FedEx and UPS as well. Um, I, I think, you know, all of that, all of that is a, is a, um, a, a wordy way for me to say, I, I think, I think we have, we have to see how Amazon's Amazon's package delivery continues to develop over the next couple of years. Uh, and then eventually we may see a uh, drone drone delivery in some markets. It's, it's, it's being tested now in some pilot areas and what's going to be the tolerance of communities to having drone delivery. Um, mm-hmm. You know, is, is that something that the postal service would ever get into? I think that's, I, it seems unlikely, but, but maybe, but, um, but what, percentage of package delivery could eventually be be done that way and will you still use postal service as a middle mile uh, a middle mile option uh, for for package delivery and I think that uh, I think that the, the jury's still out on that a little bit thank you all right uh, let's go to the uh, I see a person in the audience here uh, Conrad Lee Conrad if you can uh, let's see here up, 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 up. Yeah, see the the the, the challenge is. Oh, hang on. I think I might have it. I might have it. Um, I don't know. Uh, Conrad, I am. Uh, let's see. Invite on stage. Okay. Hey, Conrad. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right. Conrad, are you with us? <laughs> I don't know. It said Conrad wants the mic, and there was a little button, and I pressed the button, and um, we're not hearing him. So uh, let's see. Um, okay, let's try it again. I think uh, you're on, Conrad. I have a green check mark. Ah, so... I mean, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. I... Thank yes. you very much. Yes, Conrad, welcome. We got you on video. Too. Outstanding. Yeah. Oh, What's on your mind? It's a bit messy. Yeah. yeah, it's the first time I got on this platform, so didn't know how to put a nice background. Uh, I, of course, as you know, I'm a council member, and infrastructure is very big to the cities and jurisdictions. We know you mentioned about Amazon; they are located now in our city. Uh, I don't know how many people know about Bellevue, but it's uh, near Seattle. Um, My wife's from Seattle. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. Small world. Uh, so we know that, you know, federal government has uh, lots of money, uh, uh, you know, one and a half billion dollars for infrastructure. And uh, even though, you know, uh, not all of that will go to the right places, as we know, government, <laughs> you know, they, 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 they sometimes, uh, you know, don't get all the right pieces together. But we, we are looking at uh, lots of opportunity. And I think this is very good. So we're just trying to figure out uh, where are the money, uh, where they should go. And you talk about Amazon. I think there's opportunity, absolutely. Uh, businesses such as Amazon, they've already demonstrated their interest and ability to participate in helping developing some of that because it benefits all of us, right, obviously. And how it's done is a detail. You know, the devil is in the detail. But I like the opportunity, like what's happening, the questions you're asking, and the things that we're considering. Um, we we know technology really is a my emphasis on technology. Technology is going to be the breakthrough. Any any uh, 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 you know draconian change, uh, we are we are in facing the time we need big changes. Uh, I think technology is a breakthrough. Uh, we're talking about you know 5G. We're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about autonomous uh, technology. All that can help transportation system uh, efficiency, right? Safety. <laughs> uh, all these can help again transportation, whether it be the cu- uh, existing current uh, s- system uh, mode 
you know, uh, people have been critical of we driving too much, too many cars on the road. But this is our culture and this convenience. But it could be improved on if we make it autonomous, make it uh, more like airplanes. We've been flying airplanes for the last 50 years autonomously, <laughs> and we could do that with the cars. We have better, you know, uh, guidance system. Uh, we have a company like Inrex, you know, that has uh, c- control cameras, and uh, we we can detect wherever each moving system is and we can make it safe and uh, uh, we can predict we can structure a uh, pack car in our city is looking at autonomous trucks it doesn't mean that you don't have drivers right because people are still not comfortable yet but uh, the system however can be run operated by platooning and by knowing where to go with our voice congestion and how to s- structure operational efficiency, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's profitability for the company. So it's motivation for them to do it. And then it obviously by doing that, it helps the whole transportation system. Uh, you know, the, the, the roads, the highways, and people can move more easily uh, with, you know, technology. And I believe, you know, we talk about cloud computing. We talk about, you know, information. It's all, it's all there. We just have to be sure that we uh, test to people, check, let people know that, hey, this is a system that we actually, you know, to start out with, we can live with. Eventually, this is a system we want. <laughs> so I think we are working slowly toward that. And it requires uh, governments uh, to help to provide policies to consider, uh, uh, you know, protection, right? I mean, when you do something good, something beneficial, there's always concern on the other side. Well, what, what is the downside, right? Uh, because when we talk about all the cameras, like for example, Amazon, they have Amazon Fresh. If you go to the Amazon Fresh grocery store, you have cameras all over the place. In every move you take, they know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. So it's privacy issues, but people are willing to do that. Nobody questioned about it, right? So these are the things we need to slowly get people to be used to comfortable. So I think the technology is there. Let's encourage it. Let's get government. Let's get private sector all working together. And so people can say, yeah, certain things we're comfortable with and we can uh, have safeguards and then we can move on. So it's exciting mode in front of us. And the technology is available. And let's make sure that we have the opportunity to learn how to use them. Conrad, I, I think you hit on uh, a dozen really good points there, and I, I'd like to kind of build on that, if 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 I may. The um, the, the real question that I I want mayors and governors and council members to be thinking about right now is, oh, okay, we know we've got an unprecedented bucket of funding, infrastructure funding, and social program funding today. How, how do we put it to work with the greatest amount of leverage? Um, you've got a dollar, you could give it as a one-time grant to a program that does really good things for people in need in your community. And then next year it's on. Or you can uh, look for public-private matches. How, how do you bring private enterprise in to assist uh, this program going forward? Uh, we're encouraging that that mayors and governors, for, for mayors, it's ARPA funding. For governors, it's infrastructure and state small business credit initiative funding. We're encouraging mayors and governors to think about um, requiring uh, a match from private enterprise. So you say, okay, we want to... We want to build a new hospital. It's going to be $100 million. Well, okay, Uh, maybe $20 million of it comes out of your ARPA funding budget, and the other $80 million comes from private enterprise. You've got an 80-20 split on something like that. And then then the government has more money to go do other things with that. So um, if, if, um, if, if, if you're looking to get the most impact or the most bang for the buck, or you know, amplify your your federal dollars. Really, do look for uh, applying a multiple of those dollars in terms of leverage from private sector, not even debt. I'd say equity, uh, and then you get even more. Um, you know, at this point, you can take a million dollars of community development block grants, parlay that into five million dollars in a HUD Section One Hundred Eight loan 
find an 80-20 match from a private participant, and now you've got $25 million of equity, um, and say 50% LTV, that brings you to $50 million total. So $1 of federal money can be parlayed in $50 million of program cost. It's just an example, but but it's a very representative one of, of how being a smart fiduciary of your taxpayer dollars can help you achieve uh, greater infrastructure spend than someone who, you know, might just be saying, okay, well, here's a million dollars. There's uh, a very needy, deserving food bank in our community. I'm going to give it and it'll, it'll serve food for 12 months. But after that, it's gone. Great comments on top of great comments. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you know, personally, I think, um, you know, Conrad, I, I'm I'm a big fan of fan of roads generally. Um, I, you know, until at such point as we maybe get to an era where we have uh, drone delivery of packages, small packages, medium sized packages, larger packages, uh, and eventually, you know, where this is going, uh, you have enough data from drone package delivery uh, that you can carry packages that are uh, the size of a person, and then they are a person, uh, and then you have flying cars essentially. And I I think that we'll probably see that over the next couple of decades. Uh, It'll take a while to accumulate the data on safety and then to figure out what the um, uh, what what that that urban that that, that air mobility is going to look like. Um, uh, Traffic management, uh, UAS traffic management is going to be sort of a a thing that is going to evolve over time. But again, safety is going to be such an important question. Uh, But until that point, you know, I think I think the roads are, are, are are road travel in general. Is, uh, is, is a wonderful thing because it's a blank canvas that we can have, you can have you know, gas powered, you can have electric vehicles, uh, eventually you can have autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles. And the roads provide sort of very scalable blank canvas for uh, what it is you're able to put on it, whether it's truck delivery uh, or passenger, passenger travel. Um, and as a, but um, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, there's, there's, there's a lot that goes into thinking about how we finance that, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the modern world where our roads are so built up. Uh, but there's a lot that can be done to improve that. Um, one program I, I, I really enjoyed uh, learning about and studying uh, when I worked at the Department of Transportation was the, uh, was the Proven Safety Countermeasures uh, Initiative, uh, which basically identifies things like rumble strips, um, things like you know, uh, the, you know, grade separation, jersey barriers, things that uh, can improve the efficiency and the safety of, of the roadways. And as we sort of standardize and, and formularize a lot of the elements of, of, of the roadways, um, not only does it create a, um, a, uh, create a pathway on, on what we need to build and maintain, uh, but, um, but for investor purposes, you, know, you also have a little bit more certainty over what it is that you're going to be uh, building um, and the route through which it's, uh, you know, we're going to see things built. Um, and, and by the way, that, that also ties in the, the issue of, of, of permitting reform and sort of the way that we process uh, and streamline, uh, streamline environmental reviews to make sure that we're, we're having a controlled impact. Uh, we can't say zero impact because everything has some impact, uh, but a controlled, minimized impact uh, on the environment. And you can study that in an accelerated fashion. Then you can actually build projects because, again, as, we, as I mentioned you know, a little while ago, um, the U.S. is a very difficult country in which to in which to build. build yeah, I agree. Um, uh, let me add a couple of uh, thoughts. Uh, you know, I th- believe uh, changes, especially big changes, technology, especially, uh, has to be incremental. You know, takes small steps. Um, you know, my personal experience that if you have a big vision, I think most people who have big vision, you know, would realize that. Uh, Number one, it uh, scares people. And two, it's hard to establish credibility without proof. So you got to take small steps. And you, you're absolutely right. Uh, but, you know, this once it small steps prove itself, uh, this country is amazing. You know, when we see something that works, it happens real quick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it takes a long time to build up something slowly. Once it gets proven, man, it just... Oh, absolutely. Go. Conrad, let me just pause you right there. Uh, yeah. Mahesh, welcome to the stage. I want I'm, we're going to go back to Conrad <laughs> to, to to finish his point, but then I want to uh, invite you to to comment as well. Thank Conrad. you. 
Yeah, welcome. Uh, the other thing is that technology, you know, is a tool that applies to many, many things. And many things unlimited, you know. <laughs> so you talk about roads. Yes, uh, roads is the big traditional. 90% of the transportation systems probably still roads. Uh, but things are changing. People's habit, live, uh, pattern of uh, living, you know. And so we're talking about, obviously, this country is great. United States of America, uh, I'm an immigrant. <laughs> and we come here because it's a country of choices freedom of choices and uh, it's unlimited you know if we follow that route and so option is good um, and option they all have their role so we're looking at a multimodal transportation system as well obviously people who want to choose something they can and i think technology allows that to happen also because you're talking about safety talking about uh working together you know uh, with data, you know, with ability to uh, allow each to move properly, freight delivery, drone, all these, I think they're all part and parcel. And so we, you know, we are pushing for, uh, you know, whatever, when you do something has to be timely. Time is important. And right now, uh, people are talking about safety. So vision zero is a big goal, <laughs> you know. And so that's part of safety. That's fine. Technology can help. And we're mm -hmm. talking about environment, obviously. When you have technology, you can help mm -hmm. uh, uh, efficiency again, you know, green buildings. We're talking about uh, energy use. We're talking about, um, uh, you know, whatever. So it, it is really uh, unlimited uh, up, up application opportunity. Uh, so I agree fun. with you 100%. We need to, it's, it's finding out the right application and making it work for benefit you know nothing is perfect uh, that's going to be again uh, but it's a matter of uh, uh, trade-offs and mm -hmm. uh, eventually we'll get to perfection but then people say perfection is also enemy of success right so let's not draw on that and just see what we can do to improve people's lives as we can so sure. yeah, thanks <clears throat> thanks for the sure. opportunity to have this conversation so thank you very much, and thank you for those comments. Uh, quick program note, um, we, we do have a hard stop at 1.15. In fact, I don't think Jonathan and I has control of it. It just sort of snaps off at 1.15. So uh, I want to give Jonathan one minute to wrap up. I'm going to take a minute to wrap up. But before that, we're going to go to Mahesh. Uh, you have two minutes. Thank you. Well, thank seven, you very, thank so. you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, I came in a bit late, so I'm going to just give you a couple of thoughts and see what uh, reactions anybody has. You know, the world uh, looks upon U.S. Uh, with some uh, envy because we have the ability to finance infrastructure in a way that is not very easy for many parts of the world outside. We have big municipal bond markets. We have big capital markets that can fund uh, non-recourse uh, projects. Uh, we have ability to get private sector involved in public-private partnerships with uh, with uh, industrial promotion zones and the like. Uh, we have had things like the Dormitory Authority of New York and the Airport Authority of you know New York and so forth. I mean, this country is full of innovation and the ability to get things done. But at the same time, we face many, many uh, infrastructure shortfalls on roads, bridges, ports, uh, you see what's going on in supply chain issues in Los Angeles and in Long Beach and so forth. And the issue is not the capacity to do it. The, it's, the, it's the political will. It's the political will to get things organized so that we can all head in the same direction and get things done that, make, that would make our infrastructure the envy of the world instead of the Chinese being the envy of the world today. Um, so... The challenge is leadership, the challenge is direction, uh, not the means, because we have the means. We just don't have the the will <laughs> to do it. And I wonder how we change that. Well, I think that's, that's, that's a great point. When you mentioned innovation, you know, it is a good reminder that innovation isn't just about, you know, uh, the latest, the latest uh, smartphone. 
uh, and fun little gadgets, but uh, innovation in policy, uh, innovation in financial instruments. Uh, and, and speaking of innovation and financial instruments, uh, Jonathan, what do you think? And then uh, why don't you, because we are, we are getting close on time, uh, please offer your uh, closing thoughts as well. Certainly. And I, you know, I, I agree, Mahesh, with your, your comments. I mean, that the, the challenge is that you know, government rarely has a, a singular determined will. I mean, it's, you know, there's a will over here and there's a will over here and it, it's <laughs> polarized now than ever. I mean, that, that, that it, you weren't on before, but that, that one solution I mentioned before and another that I'll add is um, I, I think in, in these large scale government infrastructure projects, the, the riskiest tranche of capital is the one that you want to move to government or foundations. And that that is the soft cost project planning, oh. concept design, visioning. Yeah. Um, it, sometimes that's one or 2% of the t- entire, entire project cost, but it's so risky, uh, you know, 100% loss of capital if the project doesn't pr- proceed. All right. You, we need we need government and foundations to step in and absorb those levels, and then private capital can come in and accept a more modest return on you know, broadband fiber for Native American tribal lands. Like th- that will, will not be a big money maker investment, but that's something where I, I, our investors can tolerate a modest return, provided that there is risk mitigation at the front end. And then the second is with the uh, incredible, you know, trillions of dollars of uh, ARPA CARES Act and uh, Infrastructure Act dollars have gone out to um, cities, counties, and and states. Uh, the 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 key uh, the, the the key between winners that'll look back in ten years and say, "Wow, our community did everything right," and the losers is avoid one time hits, avoid you know a grant to a well deserving nonprofit that is going to spend that money in a year and then it's gone. Look for private par- private public matches where a dollar of federal money or state money can be matched with $4 of private capital. And then you've got a public private partnership with more impact leverage. So those are the two things that we focus on right now, both from a policy standpoint and in execution and investments. And we'd love to engage with others on those types of initiatives. That's outstanding. I think we just have a few seconds left, uh, but gentlemen, uh, wonderful to chat with you all. Uh, the infrastructure story is going to continue to develop. It's definitely going to affect the supply chain, our economic recovery from COVID. Uh, and Mahesh, great, great comment. You know, we have the means. We just have to be deploy them in an intelligent and productive way. Uh, so that's uh, that, that's about all the time we have for today. Uh, but um, thank you all very much, and thanks everyone for for watching. And I say, give me a call if you know how to access federal government capital. Let me know. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think we can all we can all uh, text each other on the little. Uh, I just sent my email address to uh, to one of you. Uh, we can. I'd be happy to uh, I drop know. it into the uh, Mahesh. Drop it into the chat box here. Please. Oh, I, I I'll have uh, to figure out how to do that. Uh, he, he did it. You did it. You did it right. I see. Okay. It Thank you very much. Yeah, I, 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 I used to work, I was managing director at MBIS. I've done lots of infrastructure projects. I'd love to hear more from all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Conrad. Conrad, my, uh, my, my email is in the comments box there. If you can see that. Okay. I'm still new to this. So I hope I don't, drop anything but uh, i'll figure out how to connect okay yes yeah, well again thanks. my it's just it's just uh, lauren at skylinepolicy.com is my address there uh, and then okay. you know I'll, I'll i'll check the, the uh there, there's also a chat feature in this in this run the world app uh that you should be you can t- t- text other users directly uh but um again if you have that seattle can, regularly yeah um you know I, I i not regularly we're we're hoping to get get make it back later this year uh, by the way, I love the uh, the view out your window. Uh, if I if I said, but oh, he's actually he's not really in Bellevue. He's actually in the desert. I would have looked out your window and said, no, he's in Bellevue. That's that's very. You've got Pacific Northwest all over outside your window. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, really a pleasure. Right. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.